guess it's still morning. Um, while he's pulling up my slides, I'm just going to share with you a little bit about my background. I'm an internist. I trained at the Mayo Clinic in internal medicine. I did uh, two subspecialties, one in aerospace medicine and the other um, in endocrinology. And for endocrinology, the reason why I picked that is that um, I wanted to do something to impact um, uh, human ability to stay in space uh, for longer durations. And so my study was around disuse osteoporosis. And uh, during my stint at NASA, I not only worked on uh, developing countermeasures for astronauts who were in space, I actually became an astronaut. And uh, so instead of, uh, as I like to put it, instead of, um, um, you know, working on astronauts, I actually became the guinea pig. And so I got, got worked on as, as an astronaut. But anyway, what I want to do today is, and with that as a background, I want to share with you how my experience in space has kind of led to sort of consumer products in the healthcare space. Now let me back up and say that during the time in which I was working at, at NASA as a researcher be, before becoming an astronaut, I um, actually helped to develop medical diagnostic hardware from space. And so that hardware needed to communicate with uh, physicians back down here on Earth. And uh, back in those days, we called that uh, tele, uh, not telemedicine, but telehealth and telematics. It went through a whole number of transitions. Remote medicine, you might have heard that term. And then eventually these days, I think everybody's pretty familiar with, with telemedicine. So let me start by showing you this slide. Uh, a lot of people ask me why uh, did a physician decide to become an astronaut? I actually decided to become an astronaut first. When I was uh, growing up, I used to uh, watch the, the space program. And uh, one of the things that I saw when I was uh, 13 years old was the landing on the moon in 1969. And uh, when I saw that, I knew that I wanted to follow in the footsteps of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. And it was that, that picture that led me down the, the trek, the educational trek that I just uh, share with you. So um, NASA has been involved with a, a lot of firsts and a lot of spinoffs. Um, when I talk to different audiences, people will ask me questions like, why are we spending money in the space program? Well, I think the, the main reason is because anytime you push technology, anytime you do something that's hard, you actually create an environment for innovation. And as you see on this slide, the space program has been responsible for a number of things, uh, from imaging systems uh, for the CT scanners or MRI scanners, uh, to the push of computers down to the sizes now that we carry in our pocket, to uh, deplanable defibrillators and pacemakers, and then robotics. NASA was the first person to do robotics, and as you know, uh, robotics is now being used in healthcare uh, quite quite often. So. As I looked at, at NASA, I saw these things. As I worked at NASA, I was in par a part of a lot of this technology development. One of the other things that I was, uh, when I was a kid, was fascinated by was uh, science and uh, science fiction, of course. And uh, I think everybody here recognizes these wonderful names. You probably recognize this one, too. And uh, just so that uh, we, it's a morning, I want to show you this. So I think you guys get get the point. So, you know, as as a kid, fascinated with space, but also science fiction. Science fiction had a way of predicting uh, what's happening now. So think about it. And and the uh, companies that I'm now working with, we we actually do telepsychiatry and we do teleneurology, and all those things were predicted by science fiction. 
So as an astronaut, I can't come to the, an audience like this and not share with you the question that may be on a number of your minds and what is it like to travel in space. So I'm going to give you a 30-second uh, uh, view or flight into space. Many of you have seen the uh, shuttle lift off, but you may not know that it weighs 5 million pounds. In order to get that 5 million pounds of the air, we have to light five engines that produce a thrust of 7.5 million pounds of thrust. And uh, I'm here to tell you this morning that when those engines light, you get into space in a hurry. It only takes us eight and a half minutes to go from Cape Canaveral uh, to space up to an altitude of about 250 miles uh, above the Earth. And uh, just to give you a, a picture that you can leave with, so you know where Cape Canaveral is. When uh, eight and a half minutes, when I got out of my seat to take a look at the Earth, I was actually coming on the coast of Spain. So we had crossed the entire um, uh, Atlantic Ocean and uh, to, you know, to get there. And, then, and you might ask what that speed is, around 17,500 miles an hour, which allows us to travel around the world every 90 minutes, get to see a sunset, uh, sunset and sunrise every 45 minutes. So I've uh, flown on two missions, and during the course of those two missions, uh, I've just had a wonderful career. Down at the bottom, in sort of that blurred photo, you'll see a view of the Mir space station in which we went to as a crew. And uh, my job, of course, as a, as a uh, astronaut and physician was to be a crew medical officer. So what you're looking at is a slide that shows uh, one of our modules, and inside that module we have a, a lot of equipment, including a lot of medical equipment in which we use to to assess our, our health from time to time. On my first mission, I got a chance to do the first telemedicine conference from space in which we uh, linked down to the Mayo Clinic and then that was uh, then sent to, to other medical centers uh, around, around the country. So involved in telemedicine um, in many different, uh, different forms even before now. Um, I also, my second mission, got a chance to do a spacewalk, kind of a kind of neat thing to do as an astronaut. Um, you know, you want to fly in space, but ultimately all of us want to don that 350-pound suit and walk outside for the very first time, and that's what I did on, on my second mission, is give you sort of a feel for that. Was it scary? Hell yeah, it was scary, stepping out there. So I, I said all that to, to say and to underscore uh, at the beginning of my talk that a lot of things that we have done in the, in the space program may seem like that uh, it's only for us astronauts in space, but it really has translated into a number of technologies that have made it to patients here on Earth. Another way of saying that, those, uh, another name for those patients um, here on Earth are consumers. And so uh, there have been, this slide kind of shows you, uh, again, there was a lot of prediction of what's happening now in the healthcare space. You'll see this, this slide, or this, um, this picture of a magazine in 1929, right after the development of the radio, there was some sense that we we're going to be able to use technology for delivering health care. Uh, this is a, a picture in the 1960s that kind of show how the television with all these attachments we could use to examine patients. And, and then, of course, right after we developed the ATMs, um, uh, there were a lot of scientists that thought that uh, we could probably use this technology for doing healthcare. Well, guess what? I'm going to show you some examples of, of all of those things that, that were predicted. But first, for those who are physicians in the room and those of you who are who have been engaged in the healthcare system in one form or the other, you know that we need to change the way in which we are delivering care. And so this is a nice slide that was put together by a friend of mine who is CEO of Memorial Hermann, which is one of the largest um, um, medical um, complexes or systems in the country down in Houston. And so it just kind of compares the current model, a model for fee for service with where we're going with this concept of bundled payment and more importantly, population health. And secondly, using integration and innovation to integrate how uh, or to, to, um, uh, to deliver health care in a more effective way. Next few slides, I'm just going to show you some examples of some of those technologies. Right now in everyone's pocket is a smartphone. That smartphone 
will allow physicians to access uh, you and you to access physicians virtually. And that's what's being depicted right here. The, there are kiosks now that are being put in uh, pharmaceutical um, uh, pharmacies uh, where you can actually see your physician using two-way communications and uh, appliances that are inside. And what I mean by appliances, blood pressure, cuff, uh, glucometers, uh, all the things that normally were in a you know, traditional hospital setting. Um, this is uh, other technologies. This is a portable technology that's been used uh, anywhere, uh, anywhere on our planet. It has a built-in uh, sat phone that allows us to pick up physiological data and send it from you know the Amazon uh, down to Houston, Texas. And then just one other thing, I went. Do we have any Star Trek fans? Okay, we got a, we got a few. Okay, so as a kid, I watched Star Trek. And like, remember the bed that was in the uh, sick bay when the patient was sick? They put him in the bed, and automatically above the bed, in the display above the bed, the vital signs came up. Well, we actually have a technology that uh, uses ultra wideband radar that allows you to do that. So what it does, it sends a, a very low energy signal into the body, and it's able to um, count beats, look for arrhythmia, count respiratory rate, and we can uh, get not necessarily on a, not only on a display above the bed or next to the bed, but you can actually have it on your smartphone, which is kind of interesting. I mentioned uh, robotics. So robotics is in everything that we're doing. This is uh, the robot we're currently using uh, on board the International Space Station that works alongside with uh, astronauts who are doing spacewalks. This is a, a robot called uh, RP2, and RP2 allows physicians to do rounds uh, from the comfort of their office or, or their home. So um, you're going to see more of these devices. In fact, there are probably about, I think there's close to 400 of these devices around, and I'm sure Stanford has a couple of them. And uh, those of you who are physicians know that uh, robotic surgery is, is the staple of surgery these days. And then the last thing I'm going to show you, and, I, and then I'm going to sit down, and this is really kind of a commercial for Bartlett, who had talked about his company Friends Learn, but he's actually using a technology uh, of gaming to do behavioral modification. And so what this allows um, kids to do is by playing this video game, to actually increase their awareness about what foods are healthy and what foods are not, and be able to... Uh, to uh, impact their their diet in a positive way. And uh, you talked about pediatrics. One of the biggest issues in the pediatric community, of course, is, is childhood obesity. And so this game, again, using another form of technology, is a way in which we can uh, get access to those, those consumers. So with that, I'll turn it back over. Thank you for that. I mean, it's great to kind of... Uh...